And there we go. Welcome everyone to uh, our Tom Salter Masterclass live Q&A interactive session with my students from the Masterclass series. So I'd like to welcome everybody here. I'm gonna do some, there you go. All right, cool. All right, so um, anyway, tomorrow is Thanksgiving here in the States. And uh, so I know a lot of people are busy and might have to watch this again. Hopefully we don't have any crazy technical problems this time. There always seems to be something, like last time my computer literally froze in the middle of the thing. Uh, if that does happen again, fortunately, it won't take me five minutes to get back because I did fix another computer problem, but it just seems computer bugs love me. They love, they really do. They, they, I have, I'm a mutant. I have a, I tracked computer bugs, but anyway, such is my existence. So anyway, without further ado, um, I would love to open it up to some questions, um, both obviously to my students here with me today. Um, but also, uh, out there in YouTube land, feel free to type some questions in the chat and then I will get to those uh, the best I can. All right, so um, anyway, we have here today, we have Chris, Greg, Juan, Ken, and Landon, and there might be some other people coming in later, but welcome to all of you. Um, so why don't we start? Um, I might ask, I might throw a question out at you if you don't have them uh, any for me, but why don't we start for anyone that has taken the um, any of the courses we have now, the, of course, the game Music Essentials, and then we have the Scoring AAA Deathloop Edition, uh, which is the seven hour plus course. So I'm sure there's got to be some kind of questions uh, in there for, for those of you who have watched it. Um, also, the soundtrack for Deathloop just came out. Um, there are some tagging issues on Spotify, so you might have to search for Deathloop, and it's not under my name properly yet. It's the wrong Tom Salta. Um, not that there's an, there isn't another one as far as I know, but it wasn't tagged right. But it's out there. So if you have Spotify, you can listen to the entire soundtrack, uh, which is which is fun. Uh, and then I was also announced on um, Halloween as the composer for the upcoming Outlast Trials, thus my little Red Barrels sweatshirt here. Here it is. There it is. So I'm, I'm very excited about that because I love the horror stuff. I've been building haunted houses since I was a little kid, so I'm I'm really excited to uh, to be working on that. And the first time in my career, I actually can announce a video game before it comes out that I'm working on. Go figure. Anyway, all right, folks. So, um, do we have any questions from our Zoom chat today? And if not, I'm going to ask you a question. What are you guys most currently struggling with right now? What's the the biggest struggle that you have professionally, or maybe not professionally, but you know, professionally, <laughs> that you have. Think about that, you know, and throw Tom it at Harrison. me. Um, <laughs> okay, so Juan, you have a question for us, so why don't we start with you, my friend? Go ahead. Uh, yes, now the uh, now in one class of of uh, introduction to musical technology I have in the university. Yeah. Uh, I have a project I have to present kind of like a demo, but in terms of of musical industry, kind of like the demo that later will be produced and right and mix and uh, and every process that we do digitally. Right. So what should I include? Because the the theme is video games. The theme is a. Uh, uh, a battle stage, a battle, uh, sorry, a battle scene with four stages of a boss. So what should I include in the demo why, and what I can leave out of the music, kind of? Like, okay, so it, it let me get this straight. I, I'm a little confused about what you're being asked to submit. It, mm -hmm. You're being asked to submit a demo to existing video footage or no video footage, just music to a pr imaginary... No video footage. No video footage. Mm -hmm. Okay. And are you just being asked to provide uh, a stereo file, or is it going to be layered cue, or what? Stereo file. Stereo file. And they're asking you to submit four different 
sections? Yes, like uh, four different stages or arrangements for a battle of four stages. Four stages. Okay. So, any other on uh, any other descriptions in there that they're giving you? Because I'm wondering why. What your question is? In other words, are they not? What aren't they telling you? Yes. For what aren't they telling me is, well, for example, should I include? Uh, uh, what what kind of approach they they want me to have? Uh, uh, like you asked, it has to be layered. It has to be a sol all solely sol uh, transition from mm -hmm. team A to team B. When yeah, yeah. Change Typically, if it's going to be a boss with four stages, it's going to be linear. It's going to be one after the other. Okay, so the horizontal scoring, you know. So one section, and then it goes to the next section, and the next section. And then, the, you know, just like a, a lot of the, the RPG bosses or a Zelda boss, or you know, it's like stage one, stage two, stage three. Okay, so um, that part is pretty, I think that's pretty clear. What else don't you understand about what they're asking you? They ask, they ask me to give a demo. So the, f for, for example, that uh, they told me that I don't have to, uh, I don't have to mix it before I present it. They want just kind of a rough demo and I don't actually know what is necessary in a rough demo and what can I leave out of it okay and this is this a pitch no it's for uh it's, it's for a class at the university oh it's a class that's the, okay that's the good part okay that's good okay good so if it if it, it's for a class at a university and you're not worried about like what other people are going to do that are competing with you that could get hired then that's a good spot so basically what's most important in my opinion is to focus on the content itself don't waste time with all the bells and whistles and the production and the polish and the mix. What you want to do is establish a strong idea. In other words, you want to, to you know, it's like if you're writing a book, you know, you want the story to be good. You don't have to worry about the editor or correcting all the, you know, the words or, or consolidating sentences. The same for music. You just want to focus on the story. In this case, it's the musical story. Um... You know, uh, did they indicate how long each section should be? They told me about one minute per section. Yeah, okay, that's that's fine. So, in that case, I'd say focus on your strengths. For example, if you're more of a keyboard player and you like just the piano inspires you, you know, maybe maybe start with that. I don't always do it this way, but sometimes I'll just start with a piano and just sketch out the whole thing with a piano. So it kind of sounds good, and this way I can just focus on the music, uh, and then I can say, okay, this sounds good. This is the tempo. This is the time signature. Okay, I like this idea. Okay, boom. Now let me move to the next section. Now it needs to feel there's a progression. Because when you're going through a four-stage boss, there needs to feel a progression. You need to feel like I've now moved on. I've graduated to this stage. So how are you going to accomplish that? You can accomplish that with a modulation, for example. You can accomplish it with... A, a change in tempo or a change in time signature or all of the above just make it you you play games right so make it satisfying to yourself what would you want to hear you know you you need to leave your room you, yourself room to build right so you got to start from stage one and you got to end up at stage four so stage one should be the most minimum introduction to get it started but enough energy to make it feel like a boss fight. And then the last stage should feel like, oh, this is it, the moment of truth. It's either do or die, and the world is going to end if I fail. So there's got to be this sense of finality to it. Typically, and I don't know, with, with four-stage boss battles, sometimes the fourth stage is a surprise. So, you know, stage three should almost feel like the last one, and then when you go to stage four, it's like, oh my god, it's not over, and then it keeps going. You know what I mean? But just study. Study it. Listen to some other boss fights in other games. You know, these days, YouTube, you can you can find anything you want. And just find stuff you resonate with and listen to the formula. Learn that way. That that would be that would be my suggestion. Good good, good question. And good luck. Cool. All right, excellent, excellent. All right, so uh, next question 
Is it Greg? Did did I miss anyone? I thought I saw another hand, but if not, Greg, you're up. Oh, great. Okay. So um, I have a question um, in in the AAA scoring for Deathloop. Yeah. Uh, course, um, I was just looking at you go through the rundown of all the instruments and i just i couldn't help but see <laughs> that you consistently had it's sort of a technical question about like what you're using is sure this, you consistently had like a maybe it was in the bus on on logic it was the uad and ozone and then something else and i was wondering if you could share what those are if those oh, okay like well if you saw if everything. you saw ozone then that means you were looking at the master bus okay okay yeah, yeah. All right. So, you know, as most of you know, Ozone is one of those uh, all-in-one, you know, mastering tools where it has built-in, you know, limiting and exciter and EQ and compressor and, you know, imager and all these modules that you can, that you would typically put on a final master bus to make it sound polished and loud and you know all the good stuff the final the final mastering pass um so that that's what you were looking at uh it, is your question what is that or were you were you asking specifically what's on the master bus yeah just what you were using like i i think i have ozone 9 so i'm i you know i'm, I'm familiar with that but then the uad one i was just curious about what that one was that you were using as well um, I change up a lot, so I, let's see, if, if UAD, well, okay, let's see, is UAD, I don't know, it, what, may, was it a, uh, could you see anything other than UAD? Did it say, like, no, tape was, or something? No, no, it was all I could see, and then there was a third one that I couldn't make out, but... It's, it's, well, it's, limiter, the, the last one is always a limiter, Okay. and yeah. I don't always use the limiter in ozone, so... Okay. A lot of times I'll use something like uh, Sony Oxford limiter, but there's so many out there, and and um, you know a lot of people have different tastes and and stuff. And it's and it's funny because my tastes change all the time. So it I don't have like a staple master bus on everything that I do. Um, you know, like for example, uh, there's another project that I did. And I was putting ozone on. I'm like a bean, and I'm you know first of all ozone isn't a sound it's endless there's a million combinations and things but i typically kind of know how to dial in what i like if i need it and some of my projects i'll put ozone on and i'm like you know it's not really helping i don't really need it so i'll take it off um but there's usually some things that i'll put on the master bus um but always the last one is a limiter and it's not Believe it or not, it's all, not always just for limiting. So, you know, sometimes it limits very little. In fact, normally my limiter doesn't do much limiting at all. Um, never more than three dB, that's for sure. But um, but sometimes it's just there for safety, <laughs> just to make sure that I don't clip. Gotcha. You know what I mean? Okay. It's also not, it's a nice, convenient way that if I wanted for any particular reason i didn't want to go exactly to zero i wanted to just go right under zero i could just do that and make sure so it just is a way to make sure it le levels things and it doesn't go above great okay but i would encourage you to have a lot of fun and explore uh mm -hmm. you know master bus stuff um yeah i'm using master desk uh is that the bx thing i, I think yeah, I've heard about that. I, I haven't yeah. used it myself, but I have heard about All it. All in one. Yeah, it it's, seems pretty good. I, I like it. Yep, that's very cool. Um, about it too. All right. Excellent, excellent. So uh, we have another uh, question. Juan, you, is that your new question, or your hand is still up from before? It was still up. Oh, Sorry. hand's up. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Hey, Catherine, welcome. How are you? Good to see you. Hi, you two. Good. Can you hear me? I have a different setup. You're you're soft, but I can hear you just fine. Okay, I can. How is that better? I know everything's soft. Yeah, I can hear you yeah. just fine. Um, also, I wanted to mention uh, that I um, I just recently um, released a talk today on the master class. It's a free one um, that I gave at Game Sound Con, and a lot of people were asking me to. To release it publicly um it's a talk entitled um 
mentally surviving mentally surviving the long game surviving something like that <laughs> mentally surviving the long game and uh, I felt it was kind of really important to discuss because there's always plenty of educational materials out there and we're always ta te teaching people how to do stuff and how to get work and how to do this and how to do that but there's not enough emphasis on on uh, mental health and overall general wellness and uh, due to the nature of the talk you know it gets it it's definitely a revealing and personal talk and you know due to the topic uh, I, I didn't feel it was right to charge for it so I wanted to kind of offer it publicly and free so um, anyone that is a that's already enrolled in the master class which is free to enroll in it's available to you and to everyone else out there um, so enjoy it I hope it's helpful to you uh, I think it works very, really well for people who, um, especially in the last year and a half, kind of feel a little bit more overwhelmed or a little s stressed and anxious, maybe depressed, uh, maybe struggling with ADD to some degree, um, all those kind of things. And who isn't dealing with some of those things, especially in the last year and a half? So I offer this to you as my gift to, uh, if it offer, if it helps you, then fantastic. You know, and if you're not interested, then no, great, no worries about it. All right, cool. So anyway, again, I want to invite questions from uh, people on YouTube and uh, also, of course, here. Um, you know, my my ongoing question to you is, you know, what are the things that you guys are struggling with or dealing with right now that are some of your challenges, uh, some of the next hurdles uh, that you're looking to uh, get over? So always keep that in mind. I, I'm always happy to talk about stuff like that. Um, there are certainly a myriad of questions that I know that are typical questions that people like to ask, but I'd rather not lecture. So anyway, um, it's Catherine. Yeah, How are so you, Catherine? Is, talk to me. <laughs> I just got out of a four and a half hour ride, so. Oh my gosh. Anyway, I wanted to make sure I got in here. So um, just quick, I just started the the death loop class death loop awesome edition which is great and um so kind of beginning of the process but i just wanted to more maybe a comment it's like i really enjoyed seeing your process like of how you were coming up with all those after you did your research and tossing down ideas as far as like what you felt was like oh this is cool this is i thought everything you put down was like oh that's great that's awesome but it was <laughs> <laughs> cool to you know hear like what you were saying as far as now that's not really like a battle thing and and i was like oh okay well i guess it depends on how you look at a battle but right you know, so it was it's kind of cool and plus you got such awesome sounds and the guitar sounds it was because i'm a guitarist so i was like oh all right well that's cool guitar sound but you know, <laughs> you know, still be better with the real guitar but right okay that you know so anyway um but i just wanted to say it's like that's like this the beginning i'm enjoying like like kind of seeing that and how you kind of like eliminate stuff that you're like, eh. and I'm like, well, you know, all those are so cool. Right. You know, how long does it take you to like, how long does it take you to come up with like all those little ideas that you were like all those things? Was it like 14 days? Like every day was a different idea. Was it like, how, how did you do that? So right. Yeah. Question. These are great, great uh, questions. You know, when it comes to that first uh, phase where I'm doing ideas, um, they come at different they they come at <laughs> different speeds. I mean, sometimes, you know, for me a, a good day might be um, me coming up with four different ideas. You know? Um, basically that first phase when I'm coming up with ideas, I call it my sandboxing time. It's just a way of not pressuring myself to worry that, you know, or reminding myself that this is supposed to be fun. <laughs> You know, I'm not really worried about, oh gosh, oh, I got to start generating ingenious, perfect music right now. No, no. If I'm going to really actually be creative, I got to give myself a chance to experiment. So these ideas um, will come at different rates. Um, and I basically will start, you know, after I start gathering my sounds. And as you can see in the, in the course that I start to play with something, maybe it's a little guitar riff. You know, doing, doing, or baseline. Ding, 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 ding. I'm like, ooh, that's cool. And if I, if it kind of keeps me excited, I just keep with it. 
But once that excitement wears off, once I feel like it's like, okay, that's enough to communicate the idea, but I don't really feel like developing it now, I hit save and I close it. And I go to the next one. And I will give myself, as I mentioned there, a set period of time. I'd say, uh, you know, generally 10% of the scope of the whole the time I have to work on it. So, you know, if I divide the time up and I say that I got, you know, whatever, three months to work on something, two months to work on it, and the days I try not to work weekends, so I'm like, okay, that's how many days, blah, 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 do the math, look at the calendar. About 10% of those days, I give myself sandboxing, you know, time. And uh, I find it works really well because inevitably there's going to be some cool little ideas in there. Uh, in Deathloop, if memory serves, there was at least one, maybe two, that actually made its way into the game. But the rest of it was just kind of establishing cool sounds and then f getting my bearings of things that worked and didn't work. Yeah. That was great. I re that, like I said, that was super great. I really, really... I liked seeing that process and also just hearing like how many cool things you came up with and be like, well, hopefully you're going to use that at some point later on. And right. You said you were some of those things you did are going to use. So. Right. Um, anyway, awesome. It was great. Thank you. Really thank you. So but, you know, there, there's cool stuff left on the cutting room floor. I guess it's not that different than a movie. You know, when you make a movie, I mean, there's some cool scenes that they just they were cool on their own, but they just didn't work in the final product and, and that's kind of the way it is I mean of course some of them suck <laughs> quite frankly you know but for whatever reasons you just need to just be able to let go of stuff yeah, that you might really like that's the hard that's hard letting go is hard it takes <laughs> practice I think the more that you just create and you realize look you know I can keep going I can keep making more and at some point I have to realize that you know, some of it is going to work and some of it's not going to work. It's in the nature of it. There's no way I'm going to make like 10 ideas and all 10 are in the project. That's that's not going to happen, you know. But again, I'm creating. So, you know, the thing is, one, I'm creating authentically. That's yeah. the thing. That's why I can turn off my left side of my brain and just not worry about critiquing it. If it's cool, if it's fun, I'm like, this is good. And then I'll save it. Or maybe I might say, you know what? This will work good down the line for something like, you know, maybe if I ever do a fantasy adventure thing or some, you know, then I'll save it. And I, ha I have like an ideas folder of homeless ideas that have never made their way into anything. And you never know where they go. You know, sometimes they'll be licensable. Right. You know, sometimes they'll turn to a movie trailer. Sometimes, you know, but that's what, you know, our job as creative is to just create. That's our right. primary job. So... So that's just cool. do it, you know. Yeah. And enjoy the process. That's 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 my thing. Right. Anyway, I great like uh, sandbox, sandbox, great great idea. So anyway, I like it. yeah. That's thanks, cool. thanks, Catherine. Love me my, my my sandbox time. All right, awesome. Chris, is that your hand? That is my hand. Well, that's kind of disguised on one of my guitars. <laughs> <laughs> what is your question, my friend? Um, well, since we was talking about your courses and your recent uh, game scores, I was wondering um, whether the format of um, composing for uh, AAA games is going to work the same on Outlast as it did, for example, on Deathloop. Are you still going to have your creative process, sandboxing, overview? You know, is or is you going to approach it differently? Because I imagine it's not going to have the same. Um, the way that it loops is going to be long reverb tiles. Or, you know, is it the process different, or is it actually does, does that format always work? Wait a second. Are you saying that I'm releasing a course on Outlast Trials? What's going on? No, here? no, 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 no. I was I was comparing what you taught in Deathloop to how you compose. Oh, oh, game. I'm sorry. Yeah, because I haven't even thought about that yet. I haven't even finished <laughs> the game. Um, it's a good idea, yeah. Well, so you're. You, so I apologize because I was getting caught up in, in, in the details of your question. So you asking me, is the process exactly the same for Outlast Trials as it was for Deathloop? Yeah, I mean, the, the way you approach the composition, do you follow yeah. that same that structure of how you go about composing? Does that apply to something that's more textual and ambient like yeah, Outlast? Or, yeah, or, or aleatoric or yeah, non-melodic. Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I think the, the, the phases 
of my creative process are exactly the same. That being said, they don't always, you know, just go in order with no return to the previous ones. So, you know, for example, you know, during um, the development of some games, there might be a pause. There might be a pause in the production cycle, right? And if I'm working during that pause, sometimes I have to pause. So maybe during that pause, I might go back and do some more sandboxing, you know? Um, but I think that the phases themselves tend to still exist. For example, the R&D phase. I mean, sometimes I'll go back and maybe, hey, who's to say that I'm, I'm not in the middle of a project and then I watch this movie and I'm like, oh my God, or I hear this piece of music or this score, I'm like, oh man. That could be a cool reference for something, you know, I'm well beyond the the R and D phase, but you know, I'm never gonna just say no, I'm I'm past that. Um so yeah, I'll I'll do it. But you know, if if all goes well and you know everything's perfect and I'm gonna start and I have this time and it never changes, I typically walk through it because there is no time to go back. Um uh, but yeah, I, I will jump around. It 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 can become an organic process. Um, and sometimes things change. I mean, it's sometimes it's like, oh my God, you know, I did music in this way, but then now they changed the, the, the engine structure. So now we don't have these sections anymore. You know, that sucks when that happens. That's not so great because you're, you're, you know, you're doubling up the work and you're doing extra stuff that is, is, you know, you could have been more efficient, but it's not always in the composer's control. In fact, it's never in the composer's control. Um, but most often I'm brought in toward the end of projects. Uh, not all the time. In Outlast, I was brought in much earlier, and which is why it's still ongoing and they're still in the development of it. But uh, very, very good questions. Thank you, Chris. Thank, thank, you. thank you. And I guess the takeaway from that is if you take the Death Loop course, it'll apply to many genres of music. Well, yeah. I mean, that's the thing. The, the Death Loop course is basically my creative process applied to one project. Because I talk about it in Game Music Essentials, but I'm talking more in general. In Death Loop, you're actually just seeing how it works in reality. You know, I spent a lot of time listening and showing you my reference music. I spent a lot of time dipping my toe in the water. I spend a lot of time starting to put it into context. And then a lot of time to actually get and make sure I deal with all the priorities and then test it out. You know, and then maybe fix things and running stems and preparing stuff and naming the files. That's all part of the process. So, yeah. Yeah. But thank you, Chris. Thank you for that extra promotional message because it is true. <laughs> it can apply to much more than just death loop because uh, that's already scored. All right. <laughs> anyway. All right. Great. Um, what else we got from you guys? Any other thoughts or questions, concerns, worries? Greg. Yeah, this, this is probably a pretty simple question, but I was just curious along those lines, like, uh, how many projects would you have running at once? Like, would you do more than you a couple AAA games, or do you just exclusively one at a time? Do you do trailers <laughs> while you're doing other projects? Yeah, yeah. Well, What's... you know, the thing is with games, um, it's not in my control of how many opportunities that I have at any given moment. Yeah. It is in my control how many I take on. Um, and typically in the world of games, I will be able to take on more than one because typically, not all the time, but typically, um, deadlines don't coincide and I have enough time to manage and give enough time to both to sometimes, I mean, I've, I've had sometimes three or more when I'm juggling. Um, if that's the case and I feel that I'm able to handle it, um, I'll do it. You know, certainly sometimes I will call upon certain team members or people that I work with to, um, to help out in different ways, everything from session musicians to additional music. If it's something that is outside of my wheelhouse that I feel that I can't, um, 
you know, bring at the level that I want to do myself. But, you know, that's when you start to rely on on team members and, and people to help you. So, you know, again, I don't take on everything uh, that I'm offered, but I, I take on things, you know, now after doing this for so long, I really like to, to, to take on things that I really enjoy, that I really enjoy and that I feel I can really deliver what I want to be able to do on it. Yeah. And I can't, you know, I can't control how many projects. I mean, it's kind of nice when there's, you know, one at a time. It's kind of nice because it does give me other time to do my my other projects. My, you know, let's say my personal projects, my my album material, songwriting, trailers, things like that. Um, but uh, it, it seldomly all pieces together ex exactly perfectly. You know, sometimes it's like when it rains, it pours. It's like... I might have a slow period and then it's like, oh, crazy crane. Like, why couldn't this just all be spread out over the year? But, you know, welcome to entertainment, right? That's that's not the way it works. Yeah, yeah. You know? So, uh, anyway. Um, Great. Yeah, cool. thank you. Good. Good question. Excellent. All right. Uh, let's see. Oh, Landon. Good. You have a question for us today. What's going on, my friend? Yeah, I mean, I guess just following on to what Greg said, like, do you have a kind of tried and true method of like, like if you've got three projects going on at the time and it's, you know, overwhelming in some ways, do you have like a tried and true method of like dividing those things up in your head and like, you know, like from like, I don't know, say two to three or something, I'm going to work on this mm -hmm. project and then from three to four, I'm going to work on this project. Like, yes. Do you have like a good method to do that? I do. In fact, I talked. I actually talk about that method in uh, in the mental survival course, <laughs> uh, and it has everything to do with planning stuff ahead of time. Uh, and when I mean plan, I mean put it on a calendar. So I live by my calendar. So you know, typically we all look at whether it's a Google Calendar or a Mac Calendar, and you see, you know, you see Monday through Friday generally, and you see all those little, you know, blocks of time, right? Not surprisingly, not everybody uses that effectively. So um, I have my calendar, and ideally, uh, what I will do is I schedule everything the day before. Okay, so how does this relate to your question? Well, I have two months and two projects. And I need to deliver, let's just say they're both on the same date. And I know that I need a certain amount of time and I got to, you know, manage my time. So what I will do is I will say, hey, today, you know, or tomorrow or this week or Monday, Tuesday, I'll just block out my week. You know, I need three hours a day on this one. I need three hours a day on that one. Maybe I can jump back and forth. Maybe I can do one in the morning, one in the afternoon. Maybe I don't want to do that. Maybe I feel like I want to push through and just have uninterrupted focus creatively on one thing. Um, so I'll block it out Monday, and then I'll do it Tuesday. And when, I, when you do this, you're making a roadmap for success. You're actually seeing how it can be done. And you stick to it. So I'm a slave to my schedule, a voluntary slave to my schedule because I need structure. And I find that it does help with anxiety and feeling overwhelmed because when you can see it, you can control it. When you can plan it, you can control it. And if you need more time to do something, you can put that in there too. You know, and then you can you might say, "Hey, you know what? Oh man, I'm overbooked." You know, or I can't I can't handle um or maybe, you know what, I can't do this event or I can't volunteer at this thing or I can't, you know, but I, I, I schedule my lunch times. I mean, not that I, not that I forget to eat lunch, although my wife says I do uh, forget to eat lunch, uh, but um, I will schedule my, uh, I, excuse me, I will schedule my lunch time. Um, Landon, clap for me a second so your speaker view comes back. Just make some sound for a minute because I have to trick... Um, Hello, hello. There you go. Perfect. Yeah, so um, I schedule everything, and I also schedule my phone calls. Um, I, I don't generally just impromptuly answer the phone unless it's an emergency or, you know, family member or something like that um, just because I can't constantly get pulled out of that focus because every time you get pulled out, it takes it takes an average of 20 minutes to get back into the flow again scientists actually agree with that number 
and I find it to be true myself. So the more you can schedule in advance and be disciplined to stick to that schedule, the better. And what it also helps is you maintain this sense of balance because you can say, I'm going to stop working at six. You know, I'm not going to work until the moment I pass out and go to bed because if you do that, you're going to be burnt out. Yes, you can do it a lot more at, at a younger age. Okay, when you're in your 20s, you can do that, maybe, for a while. But I'm finding that even 20-year-olds are getting burnt out in anxiety. In fact, yeah, it's true. I mean, college kids, come on. There's so many college kids that are in freaking medication. You know, because they have, they can't deal with the focus. They, they, they have ADD and this and that and blah, 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 blah. So there's a lot of tools, and that's why I would encourage you to check out that mental health talk. It's it's freely available to anybody. I just I put it on the platform, so anyone that registers for free on the masterclass site, uh, feel free to check it out. Um, it's it's the most deeply personal talk I've ever shared. So, uh, but I, I think it'll be good. I think it'll help out. But yeah, definitely have those yeah. tools. Thank good, you. Good important question. Excellent. Uh, all right. Good, we're getting some good stuff here today. So what else shall we shall, what shall we talk about? Who can name that movie? What shall we what shall we talk about? Anyone know that movie? Raise your hand. No? Greg, what is it? Uh, you know? That's Tote. He's the Gestapo guy from uh what's it called? Uh, Raiders of the Lost. Yes! Guy. That's correct. <laughs> Pulls the out scene. The, like that's right. Pulls out the hot poker. So, <laughs> yeah. what? Oh, shall, that's the one. What that's shall one. we yeah. talk about? <laughs> yeah, that's my favorite movie. I know every line in that thing from when I was ten years old. Oh my goodness, <laughs> so good. And I listened to that soundtrack over and over when I was a kid. I think that that's really was a huge part of my education in music. I'm telling you, yeah, unbelievable. Um, so. So yeah, so let's jump into some other. Is, do you have a question? Your hands up, or is that left over from oh, before? Oh yeah, I mean, I, I, I have another question. Um, well, firstly, um, like I know you've done the PUBG soundtracks, right? Like the lobby music, and like do you do you still do all the music for that? that yeah. Game? So so the way the way PUBG hello PUBG does it is that um, they have me doing the the main theme, the main score. Uh, it's basically yeah. the theme. There's no real in-game music. It's just in the menus. And, and then what they do is, right. it, at least this is what they have done up to date as far as I know, is that they'll use in-house composers to adapt the theme. So they'll just okay. keep on doing variations of it and, and using it in different ways. Uh, and I am, I'm not, I don't do that. They use in-house composers for that because they have them. Why not? Uh, but they, they, uh, they came to me for the actual theme itself, the main theme which um, I don't know if it's still the heard in its partial or entirety in the in the menu for the mobile game. I think they had it in the mobile game more often. But it's funny, in the game, they actually don't play the entire theme. They just play right. they just play the first part of it, which is the more less actiony part. But then there's this whole second part which is actiony. Uh, and if you want to hear yeah. it, it's on Spotify. That's the actual full theme of it. It's cool because it goes da 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 da. You know, it goes into this whole big thing. And um, a little other question here in regards to like sound design. I don't know if this is really sort of too general or whatever vague. Yeah, sure. But like, let's say like if you're so you're doing like a more like a horror game. I would assume there's probably more sound designy, eerie sounding things. In doing that, how under the hood do you get with sound design? Because nowadays there's so much pre-made things but you can totally start from scratch and create yes. all your own sounds where do you land with all of that or in your approach to something um, like a horror yeah that's a really good good question because it's going to be different for each person and my what i do is is that i will i'll get into some custom sound design and recording let's say like i have it's over in the other room. I have a little, like, for, for that game, I actually got a... Actually, there's a there's a little behind the scenes on YouTube. If you type Tom Salta, 
the Atlas Trials behind the scenes, I, I show it. But I, I, I found on eBay like this little toy from the 1950s that had like it's like a wooden toy with a xylophone with a little dog. Oh. You know, and you pull string, and it's so old. I mean, my kids get scared. I'm like, what's wrong with you? I mean, they've watched way too many horror movies, but it's a little cute little dog. Um, and uh, I just thought it would be cool to maybe experiment and record close-up miking of some of the wheels and the squeaking and the little dink, 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 dink. And then um, there are, you know, you depending on how deep you want to go into sound design, I don't consider myself a sound designer. You know, I don't find enjoyment in spending eight hours just designing sounds. Sure. But I did find enjoyment spending 20 minutes and like putting it into some granular synthesis and and you know putting all these crazy reverb or echoey and and ring modulations and things and stuff and mm -hmm. um you know depending on the tools you have at your disposal i mean you you can do a lot of that in omnisphere believe it or not mm -hmm. um uh but you know there's all kinds of things alchemy and you know the, whatever floats your boat i'd say sure. the Whatever floats your boat, jump into that sound design because it's yours. You're the only person that has those sounds. Mm -hmm. but the majority of what I do, I think, is commercially available, you know, what I use, but it's hard to even recognize it once it's layered or uh, altered or edited, you know. Mm -hmm. I get tired of sounds, you know, after I've used them before, so, so a lot of times I... You know, you, you have to, I think it's important not to just go to a preset that everybody has and just be like, ding, you know, mm -hmm. you want to kind of make it your own. Sure. And there's plenty of ways to do that, especially for a game like Outlast. You know, I don't think any of the sounds are ever clean, right? Uh -huh. sure. I'm, I'm throwing them through all kinds of dark things to, to, to put them in this, this mood, this, this feel the style uh, that I'm trying to create there. And uh, so things are usually not recognizable in any way. So I, I think it's, it's it, you know, it, it's fun. I like to use a combination of sound designy things. I like to call it musical sound design. Sure, okay. You know what I mean? Because it kind of blurs the line. There are melodies and things, but also there's just aleatoric or just boom, you know, just boom, sounds and stuff that just, evoke a, a, a response a physical response it seems like that's becoming more prevalent i think i was playing resident evil and there was just so little actual music yeah in the game and so much more just sound design you know so yeah it it, it it all depends you know and i can't give away obviously details but you know there's some areas where i am doing melodic things mm -hmm. you know maybe in spooky ways or what have you but um but uh you know Anyone who knows Outlast, previous Outlast games understands that, you know, generally speaking, that game is about sneaking and being chased and just this primal sense of fear. Um, so I love it. I love doing that cool. kind of stuff. Okay. It's, it's so much fun and exciting. Thank you. Thank you. Of course. Thank you. Excellent question. Uh, Catherine, you have a question for us. Yes, I do. I have a second question, I guess. Um, sure. Well, actually, uh, my sound design question was already taken over. So I just have a question on, like, the DAWs that you're using. Are you, you Is Logic your main choice? Uh, is Logic the one that you compose in the most? And what do you think, like, you know, have you used anything else? Or is Pro Tools something that you would use, too? I'm just curious as to, like... You know which one is your yes yes your I do I use um, I use logic that is my DAW of choice and um, the reason I use it uh, is because for me it's it's the most comfortable tool that I have to work in you know I've tried all the DAWs out and uh, I'm not going to say that one is better than the other uh, they all have their pros and cons um, but there are certain things that I'm just used to and um, when I try to do the same thing in some of the other DAWs I just can't do it so logic is the one that just feels most comfortable for me and granted I have been using it since 
probably technically 1989 uh, when it was called Notator uh, on an Atari ST computer. Okay. So um, it's certainly not the same program by any means, um, but, you know, there's a certain um, style to it that I that I just connects with, I resonate with it. And, uh, you know, it's... It's an amazing tool these days. So I really like it. I mean, yes, I'll be the first one to list some of its limitations. Uh, and quite frankly, I, uh, I'm, I'm actually working on a third-party product right now that might address one of those key limitations. Stay tuned for that. Um, <laughs> but uh, anyway, yeah, so, so logic is the one. Now, was there another part to your question that I didn't hear? Sorry. Uh, no, I mean, I think... Um when you, if you go back in your time machine and you start, I mean, this is kind of like more about the engineering aspect of like, cause you were a keyboard player, right? Was that your, your start was more musician rather than engineer? Oh yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. I've always been, yeah, yeah I, I don't consider myself an engineer, you know, an audio engineer. I mean, I do mix most of my own stuff, so I certainly do what engineers do, but that's not my primary focus. Okay, that's what I guess that's the question because like I feel like I'm definitely not an engineer, so I feel like I'm ten steps behind. On it takes me like ten steps to do what probably somebody else would only take like one yeah. and like half a step. Yeah, to use. And, and you know, years. If you asked me ten years ago, and again, this is all my opinion. I know people are going to be like, that's nonsense, you know. But if you asked me ten years ago, I'd say yeah, Pro Tools is definitely the way to go if you're just focusing on mixing. You know, because it's just designed for engineers. That's what it. That's what it started. That's what it was. It was always Pro Tools. That's a staple in every studio you go to. Um, I think more and more, however, even some engineers, established engineers, are moving into Logic. Um, I don't know exactly why. Maybe it's because a lot of these engineers are also combining more of their creative. You know, maybe MIDI in, in, involved. And although Pro Tools has MIDI stuff. I, it just can't compare to Logic, in my opinion. So um, Logic is holding its own, and, and, and they're coming out with a lot of, uh, you know, advanced pro mixing features as well. I mean, Cubase, Nuendo especially, has always been known for that, so they've always been ahead of the curve, I think. Uh, but Logic is catching up. I'm not sure what... Yeah, there's some things that are, I think pretty advanced that are, that are happening right now in the logic world when it comes to mixing. So, All right, cool. Thanks. yeah, I don't I think you're, you're like, you, know, you say, if I want to be an engineer, do I have to learn Pro Tools? Yeah, if you want to get hired as a freelancer, as an engineer, yeah, you should learn it because that's still a standard format that things are delivered in. But if it's just a question of me getting the mix that I want, then, and you yeah, know a DAW, then just, I'd say just stick with it. That's, yeah, that's that was my question because I know I'm getting slight pressure to, learn Pro Tools, and I'm like, but I really like Logic, and I'm really not an engineer, so I just, you know, was curious. Yeah, yeah, I mean, when, it, when you can mix pretty much anything you need to mix, I think, in, in Logic. I mean, again, I'm speaking from my own experience. I mean, if you're doing something with a thousand tracks, and you, you have it synced up to a huge, you know, crazy SSL or Neve console, would automate, maybe, you know, Pro Tools, it's all set up that way, you should learn it. But if we're talking about, you know, project studio, personal work, I just want to mix my album or this project or this score. You don't have to export it into Pro Tools to get a better product. Okay. Those days yeah, are gone. Yeah. Good, thank you. That's my my opinion. <laughs> I'm going to tell them that too when I <laughs> tell them Tom Salta said that. When I'm like when I'm not learning Pro Tools. Right, exactly. Oh my goodness. Cool. Good good questions. All right. So uh, anyway, Chris. Do you have another question for us, Chris? I do, but it's not from me. Um, Adrian couldn't be here today because he's moving, but he's got a question in YouTube. And sure. I thought, uh, either I can read that out to you, or I don't know if you've got it open at the moment. Uh, I will. Uh, let's see. Let me read it. Sure. To it bigger than the previous. Any advice on how to treat the room properly in order not uh, uh, to not lose mixing quality in my tracks? How important is that? Um, well, the last question is how important is that? I'd say it's really important, Adrian. Um, it's really important because you need to know what's in the music. You need to know what you're hearing. 
okay? So that doesn't mean you need $20,000 speakers. What it, well, all it means is you need to know that what is coming through your speakers or at least what you interpret is accurate. You need to know the amount of bass that is really in something. You need to know the mid-range and the highs and the frequencies. You need to know if it's too hissy or essy or sibilant or, you know, all those other things. You need to understand. Um, I've learned through many years of experience that at this point, when I go into a mastering studio, the rare times that I actually go into a mastering studio or even into my car with a really good sound system, I'm not surprised of what I'm hearing, which is great. That's the point. Okay, so that's the last question. How to treat the room properly in order to not lose mixing quality in my tracks? Okay. How to treat a room properly? Well, some might say, well, go hire an acoustic engineer or go hire, you know, someone that does the room treatments. Not all of us have the money to do that. Um, I've just been doing it myself for so long that I still do it myself. You know, maybe if I went into a commercial space and I had this like warehouse, I'm like, you know, then I'd have someone coming in. But generally speaking, I'll design it in my house in some way. I have my you know, dedicated studio attached to my house um, above my garage and it's a nice room and I built the, uh, my friends. I had an amazing friend who built the walls to spec. And so, you know, some things to keep in mind if you're going to do it yourself. DIY, do your own studio. One, avoid parallel surfaces. Okay? Um, you want to make sure that your sound doesn't ping pong back and forth. So, you know, right angles are bad for sounds. So if you have right, and most rooms have right angles, right? Well, you know, so make sure you treat those right angles. You have should have absorption. You consider some bass traps. Uh, consider a rug, consider a couch. All these things actually work acoustically to your benefit. Here's my, uh, here's my rules, what I'll do. If you put me into a brand new room, I'd say, okay, computer monitor, whatever, in front of me. Behind the computer monitor to the ceiling, I wanna have sound absorption, all right? So in front of me, I'm looking at sound absorption. All right, that's not to be confused with dis diffusion, sound absorption. In other words, when you yell in it, it's like, and it doesn't bounce back at you, okay? That's a, you know, there's gonna be a certain kind of dense fiberglass. It could be curtains, all right? So you wanna have absorption in front of you. You wanna have absorption left and right. And you wanna have absorption up and maybe, maybe, you know, a rug down and maybe not. No, I don't have a hard and fast rule to that. I use my ears. Uh, behind you, you wanna have um, some diffusion, okay? So above my camera, let me just do this quickly. Sorry for the close up, folks. But if I look up here, check this out. See in the back there? All right, so that, those are my diffusers. I'm trying to get this back here. And um, I use, those are like inexpensive diffusers. Those are basically, I got them from Oralex and I painted them myself with like textured spray paint. The point of diffusion, and you wanna have that behind you, in other words, the speakers should be shooting at the diff diffusers. And the reason is, is you don't want it to go completely dead. You don't want to be like in a sound booth when you're mixing, but you, but you don't want the sound to ricochet back exactly at your ears. You know, it's like, imagine like invisible ping pong balls. If it's going to hit your speaker, bounce and then come back and hit you in the head or hit you in the ear or hit over there and then bounce back. You want to avoid that kind of stuff. But you do want this kind of natural sound to kind of hit and then it goes, you know what I mean? And that's what diffusion does. So that's generally the way I do it. And then I use my ears. Um, and then the last step is you should tune it. Tune your room or at least tune your speakers. So what I'll do is I'll play like white noise, or sorry, pink noise, and then I'll get a microphone and a spectrum analyzer. And I actually just, I have an EQ inserted before my speakers. Before my speakers, not in my mix. And what I'll do is I'll notch out any resonant frequencies, things that are kind of like, um, 
Um, <laughs> T-shape for Tom. You caught it. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So basically, I'll notch out any bumps where I see some bumps, and I'll just kind of do it. And your goal is when you play pink noise and you listen and you put a microphone right where your head is, it should be a flat line. But the most important thing, and the last thing I'll say for today, is you want to know what you're hearing. And one way to do that is to play music you're familiar with and calibrate to your ears. So basically say, okay, I know this song. I know the way it sounds. You know, and experienced engineers will do that all the time. You know, they, they go into a new studio or they'll go into, let's say, a live engineer. Live engineers do this all the time. When I was touring many years ago and stuff, you know, the house engineer, he'd play the same music every time he, this whole system would be set up and he'd play the same tracks. I'd be I'd hear it every, day after day for two months. I'm like, I'm sick of the same song. But he's doing that because he knows the song and he knows how to EQ it so that it's coming through the speakers in a way that makes sense. And the key to EQing before your speakers and not changing your mix is you're only affecting what's coming out of your speakers. You know, what's in your, if you play pink noise and you bounce it, it's going to be flat. But if I play through my speakers, it might not be flat. So what you want to make sure is you, you just kind of want to normalize the room so it represents what reality is. So that's why, you know, I laugh when people say, oh, I got $20,000 monitors. Good for you. But that doesn't make your mix sound any better because the person listening isn't listening to $20,000 speakers. So you can use bookshelf speakers. And if you know what you're hearing, your mix will sound every bit as good as someone else's with $20,000 speakers. You know, the 80s. That's why NS10s were so famous. Bob Clear Mountain used them in the 80s. They weren't they were like $200 speakers. You know, who knows, or less. They're just a little bookshelf. But he know he knows that if it sounds good here, I know what I'm hearing, it'll sound good anywhere else. So every record you've ever heard mixed in the 80s is on NS10s. Any case, and there we have it. <laughs> All right, so, uh, time, wow, gosh, time is flying when you're having fun. So... That's all the time we have today. Let's see. What are the special announcements? Uh, we do this every month, so please come back again. Uh, the next one is going to be December. Uh, what is it? December 20... 22nd. 22nd. Yep, yeah, same time. Um, also, again, we I just released a free um, mental health uh, talk that you can get uh, by just signing up and uh, for free at my uh, masterclass website uh, and also we have a lot of Black Friday things going uh, on sale right now so if you missed the pre-release sales or you missed game sound con sales or some of the other ones um, there are a lot of things running right now in fact let me see if this works oh yay good I got it to work check this out um, so here are some of the sales that we have going on right now. If you if you haven't purchased any of these things, uh, these are the codes. So they're, they are all here. Um, and I will be putting this stuff on social media, but today's the first day that it's actually active before Black Friday. So you can check these out. Um, we also, a cool new addition is that um, I know that, you know, some like Deathloop, it's not the cheapest thing in the world. Even though, it's just, even though it's worth it, there's seven hours plus of content, it's not that cheap. Uh, and uh, so if you're looking for a way that will help you pay for it, um, there is an actual um, now monthly payment option where you can split up the payment across a few months uh, and pay for it that way. So I'll be doing that going forward to make it easier for people financially to keep the cash flow going because I know we're all musicians here. I know how it is. All right. Uh, all right, folks, so that is it for now. Thanks again for joining us. Uh, and again, this is open to anyone and everyone that has taken any of my classes. So please come back and uh, join me again next month. Bring your questions, topics to discuss, anything you want uh, in the world of music and game music and production and mixing and all that fun stuff that we love. All right, everyone, be well. Happy Thanksgiving to those of you in the United States and, uh, and our friends in Canada as well. Be well. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs>